Uh, thank you, Chris. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's really nice to be here with you in this beautiful city. I want to say at the outset that um, I'm sort of an old pal of Barbara Ellsmith and a great admirer of her wonderful journey in trying to bring help to children that are struggling out into the world. And I'm a fan of everyone in this room because everyone in this room represents somebody that's taken a personal stake in that great mission. And uh, it's, I always love these audiences because these audiences are full of people that are the best kind of people, people that are trying to help. Uh, before I talk about uh, nerdy issues of science, <clears throat> I want to say at the outset that uh, I have been permitted by the University of California to contribute to the founding of several companies, as Chris just described. And toward the end of my talk, I'm going to talk a lot about what these companies do. You can think of that as a kind of a back-ended commercial, and you should think of me as being potentially ethically compromised at that point. So I, I ask you to <laughs> keep that in mind as, as I talk about that. I also want to say that this research, uh, the things I'm going to talk about is all team science, and actually several thousand people have contributed to this science. And these are many uh, scientists, sort of card-carrying psychologists and neuroscientists, medical doctors of different stripes, and just all kinds of legions, you could say, of people in the health professions that are working on the therapeutic or educational side, and then a lot of technologists. And basically, uh, I'm always a little embarrassed to talk about this as if these are things I did because it's things we did. And I like to say, and it's true, that whenever you see a report about this science, there's almost always someone else's name up front and you should give that person, almost always a younger person, primary credit for it. Contact them and acknowledge their leadership in that aspect of the science. And then finally, I want to say that brain plasticity is, a, is an obviously an enormously complicated. It is, in fact, a vast scientific topic. You know, it's maybe 40%, 45% of scientific studies that relate to the operations of the brain deal in some way or another with the fact but it has a great trick. And the great trick is to change itself as a function of how we engage it. So the literature behind any, any practical application of the science is vast. And you have to think about what I'm going to say about this as being very simplistic. It is simplistic. I apologize for that. It is all, only on a very limited aspect of the translational side. I've tried to write a book uh, which is called Softwired, I'll talk about this a little bit later, to help people in this translation. But even that is simplistic. So you can think of this as this is a queen science to anybody who's interested in helping individuals be better and stronger. This is right at the heart of what you should know. This is your science. It is the science of brain change, fundamental to what you know. You should begin, if you're not well along the path of educating yourself about it, you should consider how you can educate yourself about it in earnest across the next period of your professional or personal life, because it's the core science for what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish to help people that struggle. So I'm going to talk first a little bit about brain plasticity in childhood, and I'm going to talk about specifically its fundamentally reversible nature. So brain plasticity has actually been designed by the creator of the universe or by mother nature, you could say, to be reversible. It can go north or it can go south at any point in life. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, what can go wrong from a brain plasticity perspective in the development of a child and in the early child's life. And I'm going to finally focus on how we've attempted to harness the genie to control plasticity to help people that struggle. So first of all, brain plasticity we now know is the basis of the brain's creation of the model of the world that we're born into, live in, and of the control of the individual's operations within it. And it occurs through literally quintillions of moments of change. An incredible level of change occurs in the brain in the sense we don't have a birthday, in a sense we have a million birthdays, because our brain, which is defining us as the people we are, not just the operational person, but the centered self that is us, is actually a product of brain change within the period of our lifetime. And this product is never finished, never complete, continually changing, continually modifying it, continually modifying us throughout the course of our life. 
Of course, everyone's experiences in life are different, unique in their detail from every other individual on the planet. And therefore, in a sense, brain plasticity confers for us an absolutely unique, an individual machine in our head that's a little bit different, not just like the machine in anyone else's head. We are unique creatures. We are unique creations, you could say, that have occurred, evolved within us within our span of our own lifetime. It'd be nice if every child had a wonderful early life. It'd be nice if every child had powerful and, 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 uh, and completely effective uh, genetic and other endowments. It would be nice if every parent and every child was kind and thoughtful and always there and considerate. It would be nice if all of the influences that came into a life of a child were positive and helpful and enriching, but it is simply not true. Life is full of landmines for every one of us. In a sense, abnormal is normal. Across this incredible variation, a myriad of the complex things that can contribute to the way the brain is changing, as many things can disadvantage a brain as advantage it. And we're all here, everyone in this room is here, because in a sense we're dedicated to help. Dedicated to help those individuals, certainly help every child, but also help those individuals that have been disadvantaged by their genetic uh, misfortune or by their uh, personal or environmental misfortunes. So plasticity begins in early childhood. Uh, it actually begins in the womb in the, about the beginning of the third trimester. The brain begins to change itself initially in an unregulated way. And by unregulated, I mean that none, nothing that has happened in the, in the child's brain that is driving change in it has any real meaning to the child. For example, the, the baby is moving in the womb in a random walk. It has to be random. And what the brain is doing is basically mapping a relationship between the commands of these little moments of movement with the feedback that's coming from sen the sensory information coming back that's, that's mapping both the positions of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the body, whatever is moving, and the sensory feedback that relates to that. So it's mapping that in a systematic way. It has to do that. It has to do that in order to control movement in any useful way. It has to create a sort of structural understanding of the relationships between what's coming back from the body and the commands to control it. And then the baby's born out into the open air, and suddenly it's operating under the forces of gravity. It was very easy for it to begin this process when weights were supported in the fluid of the womb. But now it's out in the open air, and now it has a more difficult proposition of dealing with all of the things that relate to body, limb position, whatever, that are under the forces now living, sitting, moving around on the planet. So it recalibrates itself. The baby continues to flail. To us, it seems purposeless. It has no real meaning to the baby, except that because purposeful movement under the baby's own control is in its future. The first voluntary movement that the baby makes generally is a reaching movement, reaching out for a toy or an object, something in front of it. it usually occurs roughly around it's the third month, fourth month of life. But before it can accomplish that, all of this preparation, all of this neurological preparation has to occur. In the same sense, a baby is born into an environment in which sounds are rolling by in rich order, many of them meaningless, especially in a modern life. Now we raise children in the din. The baby's brain doesn't know those are, those are not important. Okay, but among the, in the din, are the sounds of the baby's native language. And by exposure alone, by exposure alone, within three months, roughly, the baby has created an ideal processor that represents those sounds in a, in a selective and specific way to that language with high fidelity and high resolution if all goes well. A sort of a miracle. None of that has meaning to the baby. It's months ahead in the life of the baby before the baby puts meaning to the first word. But the sorting has to appear, has to occur, for any interpretation of meaning be possible in the brain of the child. And all of this occurs in sort of unregulated competitive plasticity. Now, there are a variety of ways in which this plasticity can go wrong. A variety of ways in which distortions can occur that will endure 
for the life of the child if we don't fix them later in life. This is one of the main sources of distortion of children who really struggle. We have an increasing understanding of how they emerge. We have an increasing understanding of how variations in the quality of the environments of children can alter the positive progressions and change that set up the brain as a high-performing instrument later in life. Now, across the same period, as this specialization is crucially enabling higher brain order operations, a second really wonderful thing is occurring. And that is the brain is advancing the machinery that's going to control its own change. I can't do this initially. This machinery is in an immature state. It basically has to learn how to learn. It has to go through a progression. First, it is sort of halting and imprecise not very, not very controlled way, but ultimately the brain is going to control its own plasticity. It's only going to allow change to occur in a sense when it matters to it. And it's only going to allow change to occur in a sense when the brain interprets the recording of that information or that change to be valuable to it. It can be valued to it because the brain wants to remember it forever in case it happens again, because it's a terrible thing. Or it can be valued to it, valuable to it, because it is interpreted by the brain as something good for it. Now, it's a fabulous thing that we have within us, inbuilt power, ultimately, to evolve the capacity to control our own change. And by the way, this machinery is not just plastic when you're a baby. It's plastic throughout life. So one of, the great, one of the great myths about a, a child that's struggling or an adult that's struggling or somebody that's old and infirm is that they have limited capacity to learn. I might say there are children that are genetically weakened, impaired in a way that the learning machinery itself is impaired. But even they have plastic capacity to improve their learning powers by engaging the machinery that controls their learning to change for the better. So now we've evolved through all of this early preparation to a brain that controls itself. And what we do from this point forward, in a sense, is massively specialize our brain. And you think about this with, with the framework of any skill or ability. I mean, a wonderful presentation of the rich and elaborate ways that this can occur in the talk just preceding mine that comes from play, but here's something we didn't learn exactly, in, we learned this in part in a playful way, but something we learned because we're all determined that we acquire this skill, the skill to be able to read. Now when we look in the brain of somebody that's acquired this ability, really complex, marvelous ability, relatively late in human evolution, this ability to translate the sound parts of words that bear meaning in, in, a, in, a, in a visual form, an orthographic form. Little symbols that represent those sound parts of words. And ultimately, we're going to make this translation in a halting way, uh, sort of sound by sound, to letter to letter. And ultimately, we're gonna create, we're gonna be able to interpret little strings of these symbols, translated as that in, in those sound representational terms, which relates to meaning. And pretty soon we're going to do it at an incredible high speed, whipping across the page, integrating information over long spans from vision, in a sense, in this translation. What, a, what an ability. I might say that this is a relatively modern ability again. In a sense, universal reading was a gift of Gutenberg. Or you could say it was a gift of, of King Frederick VII in Sweden, who decided in the 17th century, just a few hundred years ago, that everyone in his realm should be able to read so they could read a catechism on the path to reading the Bible. A relatively modern skill. Now in Sweden, it turned out that every minister in every local community was challenged with teaching every child in that community to, to read. If the child couldn't read, the minister was brought onto the carpet. And if a child couldn't read, they were reduced to a life of certitude, servitude. They weren't allowed to marry. They basically had to work in life as a servant at a low level because of their failure. It actually wasn't until in the 19th century, 
it was discovered around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, it was discovered that the, that children in the royal family couldn't read, no matter how much people tried, that this, these stupid, foolish punishments for failed readers were overcome. So in a sense, dyslexia, you could say, was an invention of the Swedish king, Hand of Gutenberg. Now, when you look in the brain of someone that's acquired the ability to read, they have a reading brain. So you can look down in the brain and you can see areas of activity that are bright, strongly engaged in the act of reading. So that's what's represented by the illustration at the top and the right. Are little zones of activity that are engaged in the act of reading. And we know the meaning of the engagement of the system of the reading brain. Of course, you don't have one of these if you can't read. That's illustrated by the images of derived from 20 children that can't read at the bottom compared to 20 children that can. And what's highlighted in the circles are areas that we know to be important contributor to specific aspects of reading. For example, we know that more posterior area off to the right on the screen, circled by green, is an area in which the fundamental sound to orthographic figure is being made. So this is the sound to letter translational zone. We know that as you accomplish this translation, you activate this area, not, not just this, this system, we, all, we understand all of this in complex neurological terms, you actually activate a zone just below it first, and then as you become more and more facile in the translation, it moves into this zone that's circled. We know, for example, that this more anterior zone is an area in which the meaning of the written word is very highly correlated with the activity that occurs in this area as the words flow by in reading. Okay, so we can assign, you could say, roles. We understand how this changes in a way that accounts for the effective, effective reading. Now, it turns out it's quite easy for us to train most children that have a non-reading brain so that they have a reading brain. And we've done that in probably three million children in the United States and in Canada and other places using a program developed by a company, Scientific Learning, called Fast Forward. It turns out in this case, that training program, which was applied in these 20 children, and 17 of them could read at grade level or above a year later. So we can look down at their brains, and of course, they have a reading brain. You can see that in the posterior area, there's this strong pulse of activity that's just below where the translation's being made. We know that within two or three months, it'll be all up in the circle. We can look at all of these areas of activity, of course, and of course they have a reading brain. They're beginning to read. Now, I use a specific example of the specialization of the brain, which you, you specialize your brain in zillions of ways like this. Because in order to correct this problem in these children, none of them were taught to read. The training really didn't have to do with reading. The training had to do with improving their listening accuracy. Because the, most, the reason that most children who fail to be able to read can't read is because the brain does not resolve the sound parts of words in an accurate and reliable way. So when it attempts to make this, the translation by letter, the translation makes no sense. It's kicking a dead horse to try to force the child that cannot make this translation neurologically because they have an inadequate representation of the sound parts of words. You have to fix that. And that's another way of saying is when you think of the distortions in the brain that account for any struggling individual, you have to understand something about the underlying neurological fault. It's not always simple. If it was simple, then we could say, well, well, the psychiatrist who thought they could they treat depression, they would look at the person and say, you're depressed, how do I treat this? And the most obvious thing to say is, in a sense, stop being so depressed. Because that's really fundamentally what they do. But there's a neurology to depression. And in fact, there are four or five systems in the brain, you could argue whether it's four or five, that are altered substantially in depression. And those differences, those distortions, are all addressable by engaging the brain appropriately in training. 
So what does change? What is changing exactly as the brain is remodeling itself? What is changing in an in a older child or in an adult in you as your brain, as your operations are being revised? Well, it's changing its detailed wiring, synaptic connections, but it's actually changing many, many other things physically in the brain that support the advance of the brain in its learning capacities or in the acquisition of the skill in play. I'll talk about some of those things in a minute. It's operational characteristics that are governing perception, attention, cognition, social behavior. All of these things are changing as ability is being acquired. The machinery controlling change and controlling the actions of its owners are changing as you acquire ability. I want you to note that all of these changes are physical. This is not some mystical, magical thing. We talked, I heard a little bit about mystic, mysticism, magic in the first talk. You know, I, I, what, what it made me think about was that 98.5% of scientists who, who study it think that climate is changing. And just because you could say 1.5% don't think it's changing doesn't mean that it's not changing. Anyway, we won't go into that any further. <laughs> The product of all that change, of course, is the unique person that you are. What a gift. We come into the world, an unformed, chaotic, neurological mess. We orga brain is organizes itself, in a sense, out of the noise. We are, we are raw potential that turns into something wonderful, unique, and special, especially if life supports it in all of the kind of ways that elaborate it and refine it and increase its powers continuously across the life. We have this great gift. In a sense, every child born has this great gift. It's wrong of us not to help every child make the most of it. It's wrong of us personally, foolish of us, not to be making the most of it in our own life. Very few people make the most of it in their own life. So I wanna talk about one key aspect of plasticity because it's critical also to, in thinking about issues of rehabilitation. And that is that the processes that are controlling it, the processes that are in play as the brain is changing itself, are designed to be reversible. They are designed to go north or south. They are designed to drive the brain in positive or negative directions, fundamentally under the brain's, or in, under your control. And we've studied this historically by understanding the rules that apply in brain change, maybe we first began to appreciate this about 17 or 18 years ago, and understanding those rules, we realized that that meant that we could change the circumstances of learning and drive change in a degrading or an empowering direction. I could take any one of you, and we've done such experiments in humans and monkeys, and I could rapidly drive your brain in a way that turns your hand into a useless claw. Actually, we didn't do that in humans. We carried them forward in the path, sort of halfway there, because we could see that that's where it was going to unequivocally go. And then we turned the training around, because I can take any one of you, and I could refine the power and uses of your hand in understanding what you hold within it or in controlling or manipulating objects with it. I could take any one of you, and within a relatively short period of time, I could train you systematically, in a way that would degrade your ability to understand what I'm saying. I could destroy that ability if I wanted to. I don't want to. I'd rather train you in a way that improves your ability to understand and appreciate what I'm saying. And that's also possible because plasticity processes are two-way processes. Now, we didn't just study these in humans. We also studied it in rats, and initially in rats. And we did this by trying to ask the simple question, if I look at a whole variety of things that relates to the brain's operations, to its physical na nature, to its functional uh, status, uh, to, to its chemistry, how many of these changes might be reversible by engaging the brain in training? So first of all, we began by looking at about 20 things. This was done by studies that were led by a Canadian neuroscientist, Etienne de villers sedani who's now at the Neurological Institute in Montreal. And, and basically what we did is we looked at about 20 different important characteristics 
that are controlled by maybe a thousand or more known cellular and molecular processes. It's a very, very complex set of suite of things we're going to look at. And the first thing we're going to say is if we look in the brain in the prime of life, or we look at these rats near the end of life, not so far from their departure from this mortal coil, how many of these 20 things would be different? And the answer was all of them. Everything we look at physically, functionally, chemically is different in old versus young, very substantially different. The second question we asked was, well, of these things that are different, how many of them advantage the old brain? And the simple answer is, none of them. Younger is always, in every way, substantially superior. It's faster, it's more reliable, it's more coordinated, it's more physically intact, it's more complete. Younger is always superior. Alas. <laughs> now, you say, well, why the hell do the old people around? And the answer is obvious, and that's because knowledge is cumulative. We know this. And of course, we can't, in our simple little experiments in a rat, look at knowledge, rat knowledge. Knowledge is cumulative. And it's not just cumulative, but across the period of a lifetime, it's manipulated in our minds in different ways that crystallize complex relationships of things in our brain. We call that wisdom. So if we're lucky when we're old, we have manipulated information in our mind and we become wiser. And this is very valuable in society. You can't imagine a wartime Great Britain being read by a 25-year-old Winston Churchill. Had to be around for a while and understand things in the complex circumstances of the world to be in a place to lead a society in a time of real complex troubles. So obviously older people are valuable, but neurologically, operationally, they're in the tank on the average. <laughs> now I want to say one other thing about it before I go on. It's tremendous variability. There are older, older people neurologically that are very much with it. And that brings me to my third point, and that is how many of these characteristics, these 20 or so characteristics, how many of them are reversible? How many of them can be changed positively by training, by re-engaging the brain positively? And the simple answer is all of them. Everything is reversible. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the things that are on this, or some of the things that are on this initial list. I might say we've extended this list now to about 26 or 27 things. And one of the most exciting ways it's being extended is with, an, with the studies that indicate that plasticity, reversible plasticity, doesn't just apply to the neurological structures of the brain. It also applies to what's called the cerebrovascular unit. It applies to the, to the relationship between the vascular system and brain tissues and their operations. When you advance the brain, you also advance the way the brain is controlling blood flow locally and the way it's controlling the, the seal between the blood compartment and the brain compartment, what's called the blood-brain barrier. It's also, and this relates to how effectively the brain is controlling its nutrition as a function of how it's engaged in behavior and in activity. All of this is plastic. All of this is a two-way street. So here are some of the things we looked at that were reversible. In our animal models, we saw re recovery of local and long-range myelination. We saw excitatory inhibitory response power and dynamics restored. We saw local response coordination and correlation restored. We saw cortical columns. Cortical columns are the basic functional units in the cerebral cortex. They're big and sloppy, and their boundaries are imprecise in an old animal. They're restored to a youthful level. We saw key inhibitory neuron population numbers recovered in numbers bigger in morphologies. They looked like young ones again in a, a, a young number. We saw inhibitory excitatory monitory receptor subtypes back to the youthful configurations, temporal response dynamic, on and on. Everything is, everything is changed in a recovered direction. Now again, this represents very, very complicated adjustments made by uh, gene regulation. It involves hundreds of genes that have to have switched from going north, or going south, you could say, to going north. I want to make going north, I want to in Vancouver be the positive direction. <laughs> if I was in Birmingham, I might say it, never mind. <laughs> okay, so it all changes. So here's a simple example, maybe a little bit hard to see in this bright room. These are probably even inhibitory neurons. And you can see in, in the young brain, there's lots of them. 
And uh, in, sorry, I, I don't have a pointer, but that's in the top panel. It's in the middle or the right. And in the old brain, they're sparser. And in the old brain that's trained, they're recovered. Isn't that good news? Uh, here's another simple example. Here we're looking at the background noise and activity. And actually here we're looking at a, an, an old brain that's, uh, that's, uh, that's untrained on the left. And we looked at it, what the picture at the right shows is what we see in an untrained brain. I mean, sorry, a young brain. But we see that there's a confusion between stimuli that the animal is looking for that's indicated by the dotted line versus stimuli, things that are just occurring in the background or stimuli that the animal's not looking for. There's a very poor separation, you could say, of distractors from noise in a task in which the animal's looking for specific stimuli. Now we train the animal and we completely restore the separation. We again reduce the noise level in the brain in a way that brings it under control and now the separation from targets to distractors is improved. And we see this distinction is reflected on the, the animal making many, many errors behaviorally, and those errors evaporate as a consequence of training. Here's another simple example from a human study in which they've trained about 230 individuals. The average age is about uh, 75. And basically, if you look at individuals as a function of age at this basic task, then this is a task in which we're looking at the ability to resolve information in fast time in the listening domain. They're listening to a little piece of sound that you must identify, and then it's followed by a second little piece of sound. And the question is, how fast in succession can these two things occur for you to, to accurately identify both of them? So that's what's being measured here. This is a brain speed measure. And what you can see that it's in general, the average human goes down in this ability, and many other brain speed related things is a function of time. Everything on the right between 70 and, and uh, in 90 years or 100 years of age, every individual in that right panel is judged to be normal. You can see on the average, they're much poorer than the average young person, although there are young, older people that are doing very well. But so now we're gonna train them. And when we train them, every individual in a population of 235 individuals, performance fell within this box. Not only could they be recovered, but they were recovered to the performance of a, of a, of a very effective young individual. Uh-oh. I just called in a blank. Okay, in fact, every neurological ability, we think, is improvable almost at any age. We haven't looked at every. But what we have looked at now is about 50. And we looked at it in a population of individuals that are playing exercises with from a Brain HQ platform on the internet. So this is an example of some of the things we've looked at. And what we've tried to do is match the playing time of individuals across the age span. These are between the ages of 20 and uh, 100. And we tried to match these cohorts so that they have the same experience and are of the same number. That's really what these numbers of several thousands of individuals in each one of these uh, panels represent. It's the condition in which we came to that match. So we have statistical reliability. Now, first of all, you can see in the, in the progressions of the red line, so in each one of these boxes, the people on the left side are about 20 years of age, the people on the right side are about 100 years of age, okay? And what you see in the, in the progression of, of red dots is change as a function of age. And you can see that in every one of these panels, younger is better in every one of these abilities. So the upper left, divided attention, multitasking, remembering faces visual search, phoneme discrimination, working memory, syllable ID, visual tracking. In every one of these tasks, older is poorer, younger is better. And you can see that the change is relatively systematic as a function of age. I might say in the upper four panels, up, upward is worse, in the bottom downward is worse. And now we train them all. And you can see that at every age, there's an about equivalent gain from training. When the training period is matched, there's about an equivalent advance. Doesn't matter if you're 100 or does, if you're 20, everyone gets better. Now, what the, what the purple line represents is moving back from your 60th birthday to your 20th. So in every case, we're moving back from the 60th birthday to the 20th. And you can see that the trained individual at their 60th birthday is always equal to or better 
than the untrained 20-year-old. We see this in every one of 50 tasks. The trained 60-year-old is equal to or better in their performance, anyone, anything like this, to the untrained 20-year-old. Now, there's a little bit of bad news in this, and that's exactly what we think we see in rats. It's all trainable. It's all reversible. The bad news in this is that you can't train an 80-year-old as a rule to operate the performance abilities of a trained 20-year-old. Okay, an 80-year-old craps out. There is some price of aging. We don't really understand exactly what it is, but ultimately there is some price. They asymptote almost, all, well, almost always. We have seen a couple really amazing individual 70, 80-year-olds, but in general they crap out below the performance levels of the untrained 20-year-old. I'd like to say I was an exception to that, but that would be a flat-ass lie. So how do you turn an older and impaired brain into what appears to be a physically or functionally a younger one? Well, you train it. You can engage it to change in a ways that recover ability. Of course, it matters how you train it. So how do you turn a brain in the prime of life into an old one? <laughs> what happened? Why does it deteriorate? I thought that Dr. Kang did a beautiful job of, of implying some of the things that can contribute to deterioration. And the answer, what you all, ha all you have to do in an animal model is simple. All you need to do is to just add noise. <laughs> now by noise, what I mean is noise in the processing of the brain. Think of it as chattering, meaningless activity in the processes of the brain. You can add that in either one of two ways. You can manipulate inhibitory processes so that the noise just has lots of un unregulated noisiness. Or you can actually inject noise. One of our classes of experiments we've, that we've done a lot is to simply inject the noise into the acoustic apparatus. Just you're in a continually meaningless roaring noise because this bombards the auditory system of the brain with just a bunch of useless crap. Now, you do that for about three weeks in a rat and look at the auditory brain of the rat, and it looks like auditory brain of a rat near the end of life. The auditory brain of the rat has carried it all the way back so that it looks like it's never had any experience at all. It's reversed all the way back as if it's a baby again. You keep it up long enough, three or four weeks, an amazing thing happens. That critical period in which plasticity is no longer regulated is back in play. It's open again. Now the brain is no longer even controlling its plasticity. It's as if the brain had just come into the world. Now when you think of plasticity being reversible, that means that going forward from infancy to adulthood to create your operational powers is equivalent to training your brain from going from old age back to the prime of life. They're equivalent. They're the same. How I would think about training the child going forward is overwhelmingly overlapping with how I think about training a brain from the end of life going backward. Of course, there is a fundamental difference. Old brains have lots of content in there, right? So there is a fundamental difference. We have to grow all of that in the child. Still not in there, but from the point of view of its, of its operational characteristics, how strongly connected it is, how effective it is, how powerful it is, how fast it is, that moves in the same direction going forward from chaos, from backward from chaos. Put it another way, you're born into the world, a noisy brain, and out of this, all you can do plastically is control the way, the relationships of activities in time and place by evolving it to get greater and greater selective powers. And you do that across the course of a childhood to reach a peak, largely because you're beyond the learning phase. You're operating in a largely distracted and no longer strongly attentive adulthood to all of these things that have supported your powers. You're largely resting on the laurels of things you mastered as a child that control your basic operations. Noise creeps in. You're not practicing enough in doing the things that would maintain high functionality. So you slip right back in the direction that you came from. Now why on earth would the brain do this? Why would it be designed to do this? 
I mean, first of all, it's sort of amazing that it's evolved this way. It's sort of amazing that it evolved this way. It does it fundamentally because plasticity is being controlled by, by monetary machinery that's controlling change as a function of outcome. And what the brain is doing is adjusting its operational characteristics as a function of outcome. When it gets the answer right, consistently, in the right context, challenging context, it advances. It's got to get the answer right majority of the time, substantial majority of the time. If it gets the right, right answer right all the time, it doesn't change. But if it gets the right answer right most in the challenging context, it advances. When it begins getting the answer wrong on a relatively high level, it retreats. It basically adjusts its characteristics. A fundamental thing it's adjusting relates to the time it takes to dwell to make each little decision it has to make about, in time about what the answer was. Now you can think about this in a very simple way. I'm out at dusk looking across the meadow, and I see something across the meadow, and I say, what is that? And I have to look longer in the difficult conditions of the gloaming to say, oh, it's a deer, right? So too, when the brain is noisy, when conditions are difficult, it has to look longer. It has to adjust its characteristics to get the answer right. Now, what this means, in a sense, is that you can control the switch. You can decide how to move the brain forward. What you have to do is to control the rates and way in which the child or the adult gets the answer right. Under the right conditions of learning, progress will be made. The brain will advance. What a wonderful thing. You have your hands on the switch. So what can add to the noise in a child's brain? Well, a lot of things. You can just have a, uh, uh, may I use this word, shitty childhood. We have way too many children in modern environments that just have a terrible childhood. Really, a really an odd thing happens when you have a childhood in our society. In my society, it's, it's, it's tragic. Kids may be abused, beat on, whoever, neglected in all kinds of ways. Very uh, non-playful and uh, maybe uh, not very rich childhood experiences, and then they come to school. They show up at school. They've had impoverished language exposure. They've had impoverished everything exposure, really. And then all of these negative factors that come from a stressful life that have actually damaged them neurologically, altered them neurologically. It takes them about a millisecond in school to sort out that they're not going to be good at it. It doesn't take very much longer than that to find out that most of the children are not really going to associate with them very positively. And then it takes about another maybe five minutes for about half the teachers in the world to blame them for it. Pretty soon everybody blames them for it. And then pretty soon they misbehave. Maybe they were already misbehaving. Maybe they were already pissed off about it. Now, if this happens to a child in my country, a little boy, there's a 60% chance it is estimated that they'll commit a felony before their 30th birthday. And all through this period of life, from this time that they come to school and fail, almost to the end of their life, we blame them, in a sense, for their terrible childhood. We could help them, we could correct this, potentially, because their brain, their plasticity in their brain is reversible. But we don't know what to do, and in any event, in most cases, we don't try to do anything. We let it happen. What a stupid and foolish thing to do. So this is one of the big, I'm in a holy mission to do something about this myself. This is one of the most tragic things that occurs in modern human societies that we could do something about revolutionarily. And, and I know that Barbara Aerosmith, this is one of her goals is to help kids like this. I'm, boy, I'm with her on that. Of course, we also have all kinds of things that occur in life, and Dr. Kang talked about this very beautifully that alter the experiences of a child in a way that are fundamentally, they have their positive aspects to it. A child can be exposed to lots of content about a lots of things and things like spending all their time on screens or working in these little restricted ways, but there are also all kinds of negative things about it and how the brain is engaged and how limited it is 
and how it's carried the child offline physically, and how it's carried the child out of human interaction, and all kinds of other ways that, that she describes so elegantly that are actually damaging to the child. Or you could say, don't endow the child with powers that they would have if they're, if, that they're missing because of the distorted childhoods that we provide them. There are, of course, also many genetic faults where none of us are genetically perfect, and almost the question is whether our genetic faults basically impair us in ways that ultimately leave us struggling in, in operations in ways that wider society thinks makes us unsuccessful. To a large extent, our faults are not just that we have the fault, but the wider society doesn't accept us for what we are. There can be compromise of the blood-brain barrier. There can be deprivation or abuse in childhood. There can be environmental poisons. There can be environmental chaos. There can be epilepsy, some meds, infections, many forms of physical wounding. There can be a zillion things that can put a child in a struggling position. Almost every brain of every child is plastic. The fact that a child has had bad things happen to them doesn't mean there's no hope. It's very difficult for me to find a brain of a child that cannot be advanced. Even children that are genetically impaired to the extent, the very fact of their survival means they got a chance. They're all remedial. Everyone could be helped. Everyone could be stronger next year compared to this year, next week compared to this week. Oh, I did it again. So we've tried to, we've tried to sort out how we could bring forms of help to children that would, or, or in adults that would be relatively reliable and that could be delivered with relatively high effectiveness and efficiency. The primary implementation strategy that, we, that, we, that, we, that are now focusing on is what we call the Brain HQ platform. So you can see this by going to brainhq.com. And this, you can think of this as kind of a commercial. Okay, this is the commercial part. So this is the delivery strategy we have. Deliver, programs are delivered on computers pads and phones that are connected to the internet, so you need a smart device. The training is adaptive, that is, so that the training is individualized. It adapts in its difficulty, any one of these tasks adapt in a difficulty. They find a place where you get most of the answers right, but make mistakes, and then it tries to ratchet you forward to be hit better and better, uh, minute by minute, day by day, week by week. It's optimized for rapid gains. Because we understand the principles of brain ch change, we have reduced, people don't know that the rules of psychology that relate to learning are being reduced to brain process rules. We don't have to guess about what underlies change or learning in a brain anymore. We don't have to make it up. We now tr translate, it's now translated into neurological principles and rules. We know that. And this gives us guidance to understand what we need to do to drive change with high efficiency. We can drive big changes in brains in 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 or 30 hours. Of course, more complex problems take longer. It's targeted to recover key abilities. So in every individual in front of us, we know that there are things that need, uh, you could say there are distortions that need special attention. So commonly, we try to target the training to deal with those abilities. It's extensive because there are lots to fix, especially when you think about different struggling populations. There are embedded assessments designed to define training outcomes in the kid as they train. So we're trying to continuously measure how the individual is performing and trying to improve it. And we're in most trial applications in children, we have assessments that are telling us in a computerized, by computerized assessment, whether that we're achieving the far transfer benefits that we're seeking. We're, they're proven to work. We've conducted about, or supported about 50 gold standard trials. These are trials in which they're random assignment in, in relatively large populations. There's maybe, 35 or 40 of those trials underway in different places in the world at the, as we speak. But they're clinically monitored because everything the child does or everything the adult does is recorded and it's shipped back to the therapist or the, or the uh, school. It, the monitored information for someone that has a right to know can come back to the person that's supervising the training. There, we use apps to define far transfer impacts and also to make the training more enjoyable and palatable to the child. So commonly, we're trying to figure out what the adult and child is up to in their life to try to determine whether our training, by using apps, whether our training is having the real-world impacts on their life that we seek. And it's inexpensive, and it's scalable, and it's easy to access. All you need is a smart, interconnected computer. Now, I want to say one other thing about it. 
We almost never think about training a real struggling child as this being adequate. We think of this as being a tool. Now, if I have a child that has had a lousy child that has had an example, if I think I could fix them just by going to a computer or an iPad or a phone and working for maybe 30, 40 hours on it, that that would fix them, I'd be an idiot. Takes a lot more than that. Takes a lot of real life stuff. It takes a lot of intervention that's human. No substitute for it. It takes a real reconnection of the child with actual, actual real human beings that bleed. It takes more than we can provide. We're not pretending that we can provide that. We're pretending, we're trying to help. We're trying to help. We're trying to help drive the brain in a better position so that human interaction can be more effective and valuable. So primary target is younger kids with an issue. I'm almost out of time, so you can train children who have proven their language or reading abilities. So you can, this is just a whole bunch of children. This is just children that have been trained with, the, in this case, the fast forward training program. And this is just children in order. And you can see that most children move on these little bars that represent where they started and where they ended. The average movement you're gonna see in a minute is about a standard deviation. Some move a lot, some don't move at all, is what we see. And then if you look at any fundamental ability in language, in this case, these are children that operated in a school, you can say the average gain in any one of these abilities is about a standard deviation. Now I wanna say in relation to this, if it's in a clinic with a therapist, the average movement is bigger. Because the human interaction and the human side of this, we think, is contributing positively to that. There, the movement is about one and a half standard deviations from a standard deviation below the normal median. But in a school, it's about a standard deviation. If you look in a school, generally what you see is about where these children, this is in a, these are children that are in the third and fourth grade. You see a gain in reading, or they were in the, they're, they're in the fifth grade, and they started with a, 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 a reading level as if they were third graders on the average, and you can see that uh, eight to 12 weeks later, they're all, the average kid is at or above the mean grade level in the reading ability. I might say that when you train, a ch these are all ch children that are trained as listeners, as I showed you before. Now this would include children that haven't moved. Okay, most children have advanced. We see about one and a half to two children in 10 who don't move like this. The others move in advance, usually to grade level and reading ability by training them. And we train in many other ways. Now I just wanna say that we've tried to extend this in all kinds of ways that posit science to relate to lots of other problems in children. And these are things that are currently under study in controlled outcome trials, and these are examples. Neurological damage from abuse, neglect, histories. Our primary trial is being run in, in the nation of India, and children are being rescued from the street by Mother Teresa nuns. And they have a wonderful program in which they're uh, trying to socialize and educate the children. They have two years from the government, which the government's paying them to try to reintroduce them and then we're trying to help them neurologically by recovery. So these are the sort of most difficult of the children you could say that you'd see in a foster care system or in your community that are really, really struggling. We're, we're initiating, we initiated another trial of a similar nature in, in Australia in which the target is to train about 5,000 children. We're training children with conduct disorder, psychopathy, and we're training children in prison, in, in prison and we're training juvenile offenders when they're released from prison. And what we're trying to do in this case is to help in, in not just the social cognition, which obviously must be controlled, or the impulse control, or the propensity violence, these are really important things. But all of these things also complexly relate to their neurological status and, and functionality and are subject to remediation. We actually have a trial that we just completed, a preliminary trial in 20 children, I'm sorry, 10 children and 10 controls in a, a prison in Wisconsin where all 10 juveniles kill somebody, murderers. The changes in their brains, the changes in their behavior appear to be very, very large. Well, they can move a long distance because they're so impaired. And, and the fact that they ended up in this tragic position does not, of course, reflect the fact and seem so out of it and lost to us doesn't mean that neurologically they're not recoverable. Even the worst of the worst of the offenders among us, I believe, are recoverable. We're very interested in training children with social cognition deficits, with ADHD, 
We have uh, really wonderful trials underway in ADHD. And what's different in training children with ADHD and computer is that we see the benefits that you would get very rapidly if, if you took medicine. But instead of the medicine where the benefits fade, attention control in the child grows. You look a year later, and from the initial benefits, which are equivalent to the drug, a year later, they're, they're normal or above normal by a substantial margin. And we're seeing recovery that's more... We think this is because it's more neurologically complete. We're running trials in which we're trying to prevent the onset of psychotic illness. We're treating child, children that have, and adults that have concussive injuries. We're treating individuals with addiction, bipolar disorder, anxiety and depression, and so forth. So we're trying to extend this to help a variety of individuals that struggle at young and, young and in many cases, older age. I have some examples here, but my time is up, so I'm going to skip them. And just say that we have a path forward. You know, I thought, I'd like to say that I thought that Dr. King uh, misused her path forward. This is a much better use. She tried to use it for some lame neurological explanation. <laughs> and I thought she also had a path forward. And that's to value a real childhood. That's part of the path forward. To provide it whenever we can. To restore it whenever we can. To grow it whenever we can. That's part of it. Part of it is in real world, in real life, and real children and their flesh and blood and their relationships and their friendships and their, their mom and dad and all those other. That's part of it. But the other part is when somebody is struggling and neurologically damaged or impaired or distorted, we now can marshal this science this incredible, powerful gift we have to relatively rapidly drive correction. That's what Barbara Aerosmith has been all about all of these years. It's to engage the brain to drive correction with at, at, at all due speed. And that's what we're all about. It's about bringing this science to help. And that's, what, uh, and that's where I think we're going. I just want to say one last thing, and this is a final commercial. I try to explain this in other terms in this book. So I think this book is out there somewhere. And, uh, and it, it's meant to be a leap from the science explained on an elemental level, you could say, to, uh, to the underlying science and arguments. And it's very inadequate for that. I mean, I'm not really that smart. But, uh, but you might enjoy this, that and see that as a way to get there. And if it's not out there, you can get it on Amazon easy enough. Thank you very much.